got to run. This is Will Sanchez. My special guest tonight is Francis LaRosse. I met Francis a few years ago at the Nike Running Club. It's a very interesting meeting Francis because the only time I got to see him was at the beginning of the run and at the end of the run because he was very, very fast. But Francis always had a ready smile and a handshake for everybody that he met. Thanks, Will. Francis, I'd like to start by introducing yourself to our audience, a little bit about well, where you were born, something about your family, something about your schooling. Well, I was born in South Africa, uh, 1963, um, from a family of uh, six children, and um, somewhat athletic family. I got an older brother who's a very talented rugby player. My next brother was a, you know, was a, a sp an all-round um, endurance athlete. He now flies hang gliders. He's sort of changed from doing the endurance stuff, but he still runs. Then I, there's me and my sisters competing in half marathons and long distance cycling. So I'm, I'm from a family that has been involved in, um, in running and uh, various endurance sports. I didn't actually take to running or distance running early. I um, was probably too lazy and um, I did field events. I was actually an average high jumper and a, a slightly better discus thrower. But, um, this is in high school? In high school. This is in, uh, where, South Africa? In South Africa, yeah. What city? I grew up in Cape Town. And I didn't pay any attention to long distance running. And the first time I ran with any kind of dedication was when I was forced to in the army. <laughs> and um, I very quickly found that I actually wasn't, um, wasn't bad at it. I, you know, I, I kept on being able to um, keep up with the, other, with the other runners and get faster in the South African army, mm -hmm. yeah. And we're back in um, 1981, 82, 83, we were conscripted on how to serve. And so it was during that time that I found out I actually had a little bit of, a little bit of speed and did nothing about it. And um, you know, when I got out of the Army, I was sedentary again. I didn't go to college in South Africa, and I was a late starter. I came to America in 1986. In 2008, I went back to college again, and I'm completing a degree in uh, math education at NYU at the moment. Oh, excellent. Yeah. I have a degree in mathematics, so I love that. Well, I'm definitely going to be asking you for help in my last <laughs> year. <laughs> well, my algebra is top notch, and that's about it. <laughs> is that right? Well, I'm sure you'll remember it all because I sure could use um, various stuff I'm, I need help with. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck on that. Thank you very much. Uh, I know you got speed because uh, I've been following your history, so to speak, and you've gotten faster over the years, the last three years in particular. So, what was the first? run or race that really made a difference for you? I have gone through periods of my life. I ran for about a year in South Africa when I was in my early 20s and achieved moderate success. I mean, I sort of entering the, finishing the top 1% in fields. I did a couple of triathlons and a few road races in America. And, but no, we went out to finish sort of around the top 1 or 2%. So, mm -hmm. But my training was always really sporadic. 2007. I started running again. I started with a Nike running club. That's where I met you. Yeah. I had really been sedentary for 14 years. But well, what well, attracted you to the Nike running club? Nike had the running shed on the West Side Highway, and on Wednesday nights they used to meet at 7 o'clock. Arbitrarily 7 o'clock, but one day I made it. Paul Leone was doing it at the time. Yeah, Scott Toll, um, Derek Cummins. Um, right, right. We had Kevin Sachs, and we had Gurma. Right. And sorry, not Gurma, we had Worku. Worku. I think you also oh, Gurma maybe came Gurma later. came after that, but we had Worku, and oh my um, God. I was really surrounded by very enthusiastic people. And at that time, I also met Coach Terrence. I made it a regular event that I started going to the Wednesday night runs, and I did a couple in between. But I ended up on a run with Terrence one night in a group, and I couldn't believe his enthusiasm, and it was really quite infectious. I just got drawn into faster and faster pace groups, and it took about six months to really um, to get to a point where I felt comfortable running with Worku. Well, behind Worku anyway. <laughs> <laughs> He's very, very in, fast. In his group. It would be Worku's second workout of the day, and he'd take us around the park for seven minute. No, it was meant to be, I think, seven minute um, pace, and we'd end up dropping down to 6.30 and six minute eventually. And mm -hmm. It was really a great way to get, um, to get strong. But my best event is the mile, and the first time I tackled it, I was aiming for a sub five. I'd never run a mile before. I'd never really? tried a mile, no. And I ended up doing a 444. Oh, that was in 2009. Yeah. I couldn't believe it. I was like, that's amazing. That's a better age grading than I've ever gotten in any event. It gave me a lot of encouragement. I found I'm good at one thing. Next year, I decided, well, I, I did that for the mile. I want to go sub 440. And there's a really talented runner 
uh, Harry Norton, and he works for New Balance. He gave me a six-week program, which was based around all the other running I was, I was doing, but it was two track workouts a week. And it really came together because on the day I, I managed to go um, 4.38. I knew who the fast guys were in my age group. There's Francis Burdett, and I think he lives in the Massachusetts area, and there's Kevin Ford. And Kevin Ford is the national champion in the, in the, um, in the mile. For, you, uh, for, for your age group? For my age group. 40 to 49 something? 45 to 49. Okay. And so I recognized them, and um, so it'd be a case of um, don't get too far behind them. <laughs> <laughs> and they probably knew about you. No, they didn't. Then um, we're friends now. Uh -huh. um, we're friends now. But, um, but I, I saw them warming up, and and I kind of looked at them and said, they look like athletes. <laughs> 26, 2010. We are waiting for our friend Francis to come and run. I don't know where he is in this group. made the mistake or called it a mistake you know you of running the first quarter a little bit quicker than I wanted to it paid off because after you've run the first quarter um, you um, you know you're in your, you're, you're in the stride you, you're just sticking on someone's shoulder and it worked out well for me and I managed to drop my time and then um, the third then last year um, I didn't specifically train for the Fifth Avenue mile earlier in the year uh -huh. we, you'd asked me um, you're, I have said to you that I was actually specifically training for the New York City Marathon. And um, the difference in my training was instead of doing all this training, sporadic training, what, we had, what I had done with a group of other athletes and very good coaches is um, we had picked the time. And so we knew what the destination, what the end result should be. And every single workout for a 24-week period was specific. Based on you know easy running, easy running, and uh, for the first four weeks, then the next four weeks. So there's periodization across each, each, um, each phase. Mm -hmm. But every workout had a goal based on the Jack Daniels principle, where you do every single workout based on a particular pace that relates to your V dot, which relates to the end result. <laughs> it was the first time in my life I had worked out that consistently for that period of time. I think I managed 140 days without a day off, and I purposely did it. So I didn't take a day off. Wow. I mean, there was easy running. Right, but you didn't run every day. Right? Every single day. Really? Yeah. My shortest run for in the five mile range. Interesting. My longest week was 100 miles. Interesting, every day. Mm. Now, did you run with a group? I did. I, well, I'm, you know I'm with um, City Coach Multisports, right. with uh, Coach Kane, and a really good crew that I run with. Kevin Starks is one, Stephen England? Yeah, correct, yeah, Stephen England, who's become a tremendous um, ultramarathon runner. I'm um, going to have him on my show later, later in the year. Oh, brilliant. After he does uh, Leadville, I think. Yeah, I'm going down to Leadville, too. I'm going to go pace him for the, the second half, or part of the second half. And then there's Kayla, and Kayla just won inaugural city 100 miler. So these are the kind of people that, that are part of this training group, and it's really, really great to be around such talent. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure they say the same thing. It's great to be around Francis. Uh, well, <laughs> you've been kind, but no, it's, I think we, we, um, we help each other out. So talk about the diet, because you mentioned before we started the show that yeah. you're changing your diet. At that time, was yeah. diet playing an important role? And I think this plays into longevity um, as, a, as a, well, I can't really say longevity, but running as you get older. Um, I have to take advantage of everything I can. And if diet is going to help me, believe me, I'm going to take advantage of it. There's a lot of advice out there. And one of them is, let me just read this one book that, uh, you know, let me find this one method. So I read Matt Fitzgerald's book called Performance Nutrition mm -hmm. for Runners. And it really was that. And he, the thing that stuck with me was that the food you eat is, can help your performance. So I, I try to follow a lot of his principles. Use pre-race nutrition or pre-workout nutrition. Worry about your post-workout nutrition. Mm -hmm. Things I hadn't really thought of before. So things like that were really helpful. And more recently, I read about um, Scott Jurek and his great performances all done on a, you know, he's, he's one of the 
best ultra runners that America's ever produced. He's one of the best in the world. In the world, yeah. And I find him to be a great inspiration. I don't think I could be as disciplined as to follow that at this point, but I think I would work towards that, a vegan diet. Coach Terence does that yep. and, uh, successfully. And so I think that diet is a performance enhancer. And I think to take advantage of that is definitely, definitely helps me as I get older. Okay, so you weren't necessarily doing this two or three years ago. This is now a more recent phenomenon to your diet change? Over this period of being sedent, from being sedentary to now, I definitely have changed up, and you know, changed my diet, yeah. Well, let's talk about, you mentioned Scott Yarrick, he's a famous ultramarathon, mm. but you recently did one of the most famous ultramarathons in the world, known as Conrad's. It's the oldest one in the world. Mm. I think it's the largest, I'm not sure, maybe over 20,000? Conrad's, I, it may, I don't know if it's the oldest, because London to Brighton has been around for a long time, but it, it, it is one of the oldest ultramarathons in the world. It's a unique one that it's based on, um, that it changes direction every year. One year is an uphill run and one year is a downhill run. You run from Peter Maritzburg to Durban. Which is in South Africa. One. In South Africa, correct. And it has a tremendous number of, a tremendous turnout. I think about 18,000 registered for the race. A few people don't make it to the start line for you no know, travel or injuries, but um, I think I stood in the start line of 17,000 people. And this is to run 56 miles? 56 miles, correct. Well, and this, was, this was your first time, right? It is my first time doing Comrades. And, and this, is, this time we're going downhill, I think. It is a downhill run, correct? It's did a misnomer. Did it feel like downhill? It is awful. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't feel like downhill because the first half of the race is really rolling hills, and then there are two incredibly steep descents that run for about four or five miles and you that's where you lose your altitude and think about the year the next year if you do it the other way around you actually got to climb these <laughs> hills to gain your altitude well you were thinking about that where you were running and oh my gosh uh, if I do this again or if you do it next year up the hills oh I did think about that I did I had really good mileage in my legs leading up to comrades but I really wasn't prepared for the hills and anyone going to run that race should consider doing extended running a lot of hill work yeah and I think the the knowledge base in the South African running clubs because 18,000 people run so there's a most r clubs in South Africa send runners to the comrades and some people have done it five six times before and um, so they they really know how to train for it there and I think I walked in um, <laughs> kind of blase well, and thinking how, no how problem. Well how did you pick comrades you know just was your first time out of the blue? It was for the, the first time I, it had never been on my radar as a race that I wanted to do I would never have thought comrades is is my goal, considering I'm a much better miler than anything else. Um, but I was, um, I I, this last year I, I, I turned 49, and um, so I'm getting, I decided to do a lot of things that I don't normally do, like trail racing and um, mountain running, and um, a lot more ultra stuff. And, and that's what my friends like uh, Steve England is focused on that. And since I love to run with Stephen and Rui, I, um, and Kayla, I, um, I did more of the, the type of workouts that they were doing, and then suddenly Comrades became an idea, and, you know, and I said, well, why don't I go to Comrades and combine it with the trip to see my family? Excellent. And mm. relatively speaking, Comrades easy to get into. I think the only requirement is to have a five-hour or less marathon. Yeah. I understand you got to meet one of your country's most famous runners, the famous Solar Bud. <laughs> Interesting enough, I did. I knew that Zola Bud was going to run the Comrades, so I always assumed that somewhere along the course I might see Zola Bud, and I knew, and I also heard that she was going to run with nine-time winner Bruce Fordyce. He's South African, very talented. He's won London to Brighton. Um, he's um, quite no, really talented, mm -hmm. and um, and to win Comrades nine times, <laughs> it is amazing. And and I never saw Zola on the course. I ended up an hour behind, and I ended up at nine and a half hours, and Zola about ended up at um, um, eight and a half hours. In terms of doing training, specific training, um, I think she's still running as an age group athlete, but and as, as a cross-country runner, 
at um, in her late 40s, and I think she keeps up with everybody. I mean, yes, yes, yes. I, um, I had finished the race, and um, I had arranged to meet um, my girlfriend Maria and a couple of the other um, people I'd run with at a, at a bar restaurant on the waterfront in Durban. And it is a mile walk from the stadium finish to the restaurant. And I thought there'd be too many cars and, you know, and too much confusion to try and organize anything any closer. And um, after I'd finished the race, I collected my bag and hobbled the mile to the, um, to the restaurant. And as I arrived at the restaurant, Zola Bud was walking out. And I didn't recognize her, but she saw that I was in running clothes. And she turned to me and said, congratulations. And I, I looked up, and I was standing right in front of Zola Bud, and I sort of stumbled. Well, 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 I do. <laughs> and uh, so it was really a, a chance meeting of Zola. Now, she had finished so far ahead of me that she was showered, she was wearing jeans, she, was, <laughs> she had had a meal, <laughs> and she was going back to the stadium for, for, um, for whatever else you know, was happening. Oh, that's great. Well, maybe you would invite her to the, to the mile. It would have been great to have, um, to have actually shared a few words with her. You know, it, and it, it, at the time in South Africa, um, when Zolabad became famous or infamous for, um, first of all, South Africa was banned from athletics because of um, apartheid and the Glen Eagles yeah, Agreement. I think he ran for a while under the English flag. They accelerated her residency application or citizen applica citizenship to allow her to race. Oh, especially the, the Olympics. The, for, he's in, famous in the for Olympics. that incident with Mary Decker. Red in second, Sly is third, Quika in fourth. That group of four now begins to extend its advantage over the rest of the pack. Zola Bud has the lead. When they cross the line this time around, there will be three laps to go. Infield. It so was Mary Zola Decker. Bud's inexperience. She cut in on Mary Decker too soon. Mary stepped on her once and stepped on her again. So Decker, the crowd booing. Most of the crowd here. Mary Decker in agony in the infield as the crowd in unison begins to boo. And the race continues between Sly and Quika and Bud. Here we see the incident. Zola Bud just not giving Mary enough room. She gets stepped on once. They both retain their composure. Zola gets back in the stride. She needs to have a stride length before she could cut in on Decker. Mary, very close to the pole. There's no way that Mary moved out to, to hit her, she, but she stepped on her because Zola was too close. Now let's see what happened to Mary. Straight over the curb, into the infield. Foul, because you see how close Mary was to that white inside rail. And it really defined her, I mean, her, her legacy is so defined by that. And um, few people know that she's actually, that after that she was world champ, cross country champion twice. Well, after that. Oh, after interesting. that yeah. I know before that she was a champion multiple times on her age group. Like she started running at 17, a winning award but all at all that would have been, in South Africa, and a lot of that would have been um, not really internationally recognized because of the apartheid government. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. And, um, and she's continued to this day to be a, a really good athlete, and I think um, hopefully now is less defined by that particular um, incident. It's hard to tell, but now that the Olympics is coming, mm. they'll relive that moment because I think it's that incident with Mary Decker is rated like number 72 in the top 100 moments in Olympic history. Yeah. In fact, I think by all accounts, uh, Sola never saw the, the video of that. You know, she's so upset over that. Mm. But anyway, but let's talk about the, the Olympics that's coming up because yeah. South Africa is, always has great representation. And you have a couple of very unique running individuals. Mm. One is known as the Blade Runner, yeah. Oscar Pistorius. Mm. So what do you think of uh, the controversy surrounding him. Is he very popular in, in South Africa? He's definitely a popular sports figure, yeah, and people follow his, um, his story passionately because he's, he transcends his condition. I mean, he's born without bones in his lower legs and he gets a, you know, a prosthetic device and plays all kinds of sports as a kid. And, um, and then 
competes in the Paralympics and wins the is it 100, 200, and 400, mm -hmm. but gets good enough to run a 45 second 400 meter, which makes him, which is world class, is the Olympic standard, right. and um, and makes the the four by four um, team for South Africa. That's right for the, the coming Olympics. So that's. Yeah. That's going to generate a lot of a lot of interest. It is a lot of interest, and it's a lot of contra uh, controversy because um, um, people wonder: it, is it an advantage or is it not an advantage to um, are the prosthetic legs um, driving him faster? Um, the one thing I look at is in mo in sports like the Ironman, when you see a, a an athlete on with prosthetic legs, they compete on an even playing field. That's right. They swim, they bike, they run. No one says a word That's about right. it. That's right. Okay? That's right. But you, should a, a, a disabled athlete get to that international level, all of a sudden now, oh, those legs are definitely an advantage. <laughs> so there's a double standard. But it does bring to the forefront um, 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 issues that uh, political issues and um, social issues about ability or disability mm -hmm. and this man is clearly transcending that mm -hmm. and I wish him the very best. They brought him, it's a moment in time the Olympics and the, these Olympic Games people that are smarter than I have decided that his legs are not an advantage and that he should run. I think running over the past few years has become defined as a skill what he is is very, very skillful, as well as talented. Mm. And he obviously put in a ton of work to get to that kind of level. So sure. I think he deserves to be there. And, and I, I think it's going to be just as exciting as watching mm -hmm. Michael Phelps in, in the swimming pool. It's going oh, to be yeah. great to watch the 4 yeah. by 400 And I think South Africa will medal because they won the silver in some world games you know, with, with Oscar as a team member. Yeah. That's interesting as watching Phelps. I agree with you there. Um, it's strange, though, that um, there's actually another athlete which we talked about earlier. Oh, the famous Casta uh, Semanya? Semanya. Semanya. She's the 800 meters? Or eight? And she'd won the 800 at the, um, was it the 2008 World Games and really came, um, World Cup in Berlin and come to um, international attention, and people decided that they should do gender testing or uh, find out is this man or is this a woman. I think, okay, the testing has to be done. It's a massive invasion of privacy. Um, it is also, um, it once again, brings issues of sex, gender, race, politics, into it, the forefront of sports. And again, it's another South African athlete. Isn't that just a, that, a strange that is, occurrence? That's so, so odd, the mm. South African. Yeah, he was so dominant in her in her races. Like you know, with I, I guess the gap was even greater between Bolt and his competitors. So he's super superhuman. <laughs> well, I guess they're going to run test on him. She is extremely popular in South Africa, and um, and I just read that I think she's going to be the um, flag bearer for the um, for the South African team. That's right. That was the recent so, news. There was between her and Oscar, and they decided to give it to her. And I, once again, I wish her well. The Olympics are a moment in time. Probably at the 2016 games, there'll be a, if the, the, the same decisions might be overturned. But I wish these athletes really well. Oh, you know? it'll be very exciting mm. Olympics. But I had Coach Terrence here. Mm. He talked about the marathon that he did with you, okay. Tethered, the <laughs> Tethered Marathon, God's Country. Mm. And, and your nickname was not there. Not there? No. Not taken? That's the it? reality. I was not again. Not again? Yeah. Not again. And what was, what well, was well, it? Well, someone I think was not taken. I think you're quite right. What's I, that? I don't know who was not taken, but I think that might have been one of the names. It was a play on words. We were tied together, so they were knots. And it was a, kind of a ridiculous thing to do. <laughs> they were preposterous. And, um, but, and so I, just, I said, not again. That I chose that as a name. And when I, when I think about it, it was um, a crazy day because We'd all run together untethered numerous times. We'd practiced tethered once and found out, oh, we can, we can run as a tight-knit group really, really easily. So it really wasn't the challenge of staying together, not tripping over each other, but it was that your best run was going to be as good as the, the person's worst run in the group. Or if you were having a strong moment, you had to put your strong moment aside because it depends on you ran at the pace of the person who's having the toughest time. Right, right. Someone is a great hill climber. Someone is a great descender. But one of the funniest things that happened on the race was um, there was a man. We were running up 
the first part of the course is all uphill till about the end of, I want to say mile 16, and there's a really long, long hill. And as we got up to the crest of the hill, we overtook a man who was lying, I think, seventh. Five of us overtook him, so he went from seventh and we bumped him out of the top ten. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that is sort of, that really was, um, to me, was one of a well, funny point funny. in the race, yeah. Well, and you got into the Guinness World Record. That's correct. Um, Chris Solars, who holds numerous Guinness World Records, um, hatched the uh, plan to, um, to do a tethered marathon and put, the, put everything in, pr in, in place to make this happen wow. and got the verification done. And um, yeah, we have, a, we have certificates from uh, Guinness. That is a special moment. <laughs> silly, but still. It really is silly, but it's fun. Oh, great. Mm. Great. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming in and sharing all these great stories. And I wish you great success and much happiness in all your endeavors. Thank you. Well, it's been a pleasure being here. and It's been a pleasure getting to know you over the years. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That is amazing, the tethered marathon. I suggested the idea to a couple of women. Hey, you know, you guys should do that too. If there's a male record, they could be just as easy yeah, a female record, record for the you know. um, for but, the same uh, event. One of the women says, uh, they don't think five women could get along together for 26.2 miles. Well, once again, it's do you have to, um, you, you know, you put your own personal agenda on hold and you, and also you've got to find five people who are in marathon shape, who aren't, who don't care about who can run a marathon you know, on, on short notice and, uh, and don't think it's going to um, hurt their, their other goals. Yeah, yeah. For instance, if you came to me the week before the Fifth Avenue Mile and asked me to do a tethered marathon, I'd have to decline. Right, that's true. And you all had to be free that, that weekend. All to be free that weekend, yeah, in the summer, yeah. It sounded like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I think it was. I got the call on the Tuesday night. And then when it was like that weekend? On the Saturday, yeah. <laughs> well, wait, so well, you already had trained for it. You were planning it. No, 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 no. We, I, Chris and, and Terrence and Brad had hatched the plan and knew about it. And at the last minute, they asked if I could do it. And I said, no, no, no. OK, yes. And then, um, and then they said, what do you think Stephen would think of the idea? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and of course, Stephen said yes. Yeah.